got that one. So you, do you want to pick the two 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 or now, or should I start on one? Okay, sure. So I think while we still have the access to the other hangar, if I could ask you all to get up and come with us, we're going to take a look at an actual TT2 trainer glider from World War II. It'll be part of the presentation I'll talk about in just a little bit. So while we have the access, we should kind of do that now and then come right back. Through the glass doors. We'll go right through the glass doors on the other side. Are you okay? I'll try to speak up a little bit. So this is a Schweitzer TG2 sailplane. It's a two-seater sailplane uh, constructed roughly 1942 uh, at the Schweitzer factory in Elmira, New York. Uh, they were made specifically for glider training. I'll talk about the glider training program as a part of my, trust, my presentation. But basically, to give part of the story away, people were trained in these gliders to be able to fly very, very large troop transport gliders during the war. Gliders that could carry 16 to 20 people behind enemy lines being towed by a C-47, released typically at nighttime uh, behind enemy lines for landing silently so that we would be able to deploy troops ahead of an invasion. Most of the invasions in World War II had some degree of glider involvement. And these kinds of gliders were used for the training of those pilots. That was a very difficult mission for those pilots. They were typically given a pistol as their weapon and then told, if you survive the landing, try to get back through enemy lines, then back through your own lines to be able to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, the, the, uh, the, death, the fatality rate on those missions was extremely high. So we, we, but we, we owe a lot to those fighter pilots. They did succeed in planning troops ahead of our invasions that helped out quite a lot. Uh, this particular glider I researched uh, for the museum just recently. Uh, after the war, it was purchased by a group in Seattle. Uh, it was used to train air scouts in Seattle through the 1950s into the 1960s and 1970s. Literally hundreds of hours every year, hundreds of students taking training rides and, and soaring to become their own sailplane pilot. So this, this aircraft did a lot of training, a lot of hours. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how it ended up back with the museum here at March. But of course, it's great that it is. And there aren't many of these still flying today. There are just a few. Uh, one in particular, a friend of mine, Jeff Bayard, has one that's restored and flying at Tehachapi. I've had the pleasure of flying in that sailplane. It's a great sailplane to fly in. It's a lot of fun. That's the one that's on our flyer. Isn't it? And that's the one that's on your flyer. I will say I've, I've had the pleasure of handling the controls of one of these. It's, you have to work really hard to get the ailerons to do their thing. They're big, clunky barn door ailerons. It takes a lot of effort to fly the plane. Very different than a modern sailplane today. So happy to answer any questions before we get back. How, yeah. how are these at soaring? Very good at soaring. So the question was, how are these at soaring? Many of these gliders here in Southern California were used at 29 Palms for their training facility. At the time, it was called Condor Field. And they would go up not only just to do the pattern and mm -hmm. learn how to fly, but also sometimes do a little bit of thermal soaring. Mm -hmm. Very, very good at thermal soaring. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk a little bit about how they were used after the war by, for recreation by people. We'll talk about that as part of the lecture. Now, the, the, for the glider training during the war, it was mostly aero tow or winch launch? Mostly aero tow, some winch launch, depending on the location. And there were training facilities all around America. But for instance, at 29 Palms, it was mostly aero tow. What, what, what was the tug aircraft? Yeah, great question. I do not know the answer. Sorry, it doesn't matter. <coughs> mind. Sorry. You know, Gary, I can see the uh, pictures. I don't had, know. We had an interesting anecdote. Yeah. We had another presentation about the training out there in the desert. Yeah. And uh, if the tow pilot uh, didn't like the way the student was flying the glider, giving him a hard time, he cut him loose over the desert. You know, <laughs> and and left him for an like off-field <laughs> landing. Yeah. Is, this, yeah. is it a steel tube fuselage? Steel tube wood fuselage. Wings? Steel tube fuselage. Steel wings. Rib, ribs are made out of steel. Mm. So this is all uh, aluminum. I think it's yeah. aluminum. Yes. Schweitzer, steel, it but it's steel too, but it's, it's right, exactly right. Uh, Gary, is yes. Schweitzer still making gliders? Schweitzer is no longer making uh, gliders. They made, heli they made gliders for years uh, to the 1980s, even into the 1990s, became a helicopter uh, uh, outfit, and then closed their doors. I think they were bought by Sikorsky. The last mm. time I was there, they were making ag planes. Yes, they made ag planes too. Yeah. Mm. So, it's great that the museum has an example. What, and we'll what's the empty so weight on this? Wow. <laughs> wow. Don't know the answer, sorry. No, I do not. I can get that. Yeah, How high of an altitude does it go? Yes, great question. In fact, several two-place altitude records were set in TG2s and TG3s. Uh, at the time, in the 1940s, that was like 15,000 feet. Uh, certainly, they could go higher. It's just a matter of taking oxygen on board and being able to fly in 
cold and dressing warm and dressing enough. appropriately for that. So <laughs> yeah, they could go very, very high, but not necessarily somebody, designed for that. So. We have somebody here who did that. Is Robert Harris here? He is. Awesome. <laughs> excellent. Oh, you're in my talk. So let's go back and hear the talk. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> Okay, um, again, thank you so much for the invitation. I appreciate the opportunity to come tell you about this story. Um, it's a complicated story. There's a lot of history in Southern California for soaring, far too much than I can plug into one hour. Uh, I did my best. Uh, I'm from San Diego initially, and I've studied a lot of the history in San Diego specifically, so a lot of this talk will be about San Diego, of course, that's only a part of Southern California, and, uh, and I'd love to come back and hopefully experiment with other parts of, of Southern California and tell more about Hammond or Lake Elsinore or other parts that are familiar for soaring for some of the people in the audience. But this will be more about general, our, uh, general soaring in, in San Diego area, or Southern California focused on San Diego. And I want to start with a gentleman named John Montgomery. Um, many people may not know about his history. He's in the past been a very sort of mysterious figure in aviation history, especially uh, even in Southern California, did he fly or did he not fly? What did he do? I had the pleasure of meeting his great-grandnephew and researching his biography over 10 years and writing a biography about this gentleman. So we really understood his history, I think, better than most. And John initially was born and raised in Yuba City, California, up near Sacramento, moved to Oakland and then did schooling in the Bay Area before the family moved to San Diego, a location named Otay, which is south of Chula Vista, near the Mexican border. Yeah, big jets. Quiet sounds of gliding. Yes, quiet sounds of gliding. Outside. Um, he, he received schooling specifically in physics and math, and the type of schooling he was receiving at that time was mainly based on hydrodynamics, water-based physics. He did exceedingly well in these classes, uh, recognized for his talent in science, and received a bachelor's degree, and then one year later his master's degree in physics. His family moved to San Diego in 1882. Uh, he came a little bit later, one year later, 1883. And they lived on this, this ranch, uh, which at the time was very remote to any other ranches in the local area. Uh, but being a courageous scientist, he convinced his parents to be able to still do science, despite the fact he was very remote. And in this barn, uh, he had this laboratory. His parents decided it's okay for him to play around with science, which is a good thing for all of us. And he was doing experiments with electricity. He's got a little place to make a spark here. He's got a gyroscope to do planetary rotation of motions. He was very interested in why certain planets have retrograde motions relative to other planets. He's doing experiments with generating electricity, all sorts of different experiments. But it was really the, the, uh, the outdoor observations that made him really curious. Outside in San Diego, especially uh, in the winter months, were these amazing American pelicans that would migrate to San Diego Bay every year, thousands of them, very large birds, and they would be able to circle and soar without flapping and rise in the air. And that just mystified him. How is it possible that this mass, with no motive power, could lift and go high in the air? The mass, if I added it up, is more than my mass. So if I could just figure out the physics of that system, that means maybe I could fly too. And that was really a challenge for him. He set off to try to understand this by, first of all, trying to figure out the motive power problem. How am I going to propel myself through the air? Then figure out equilibrium in flight. How do I get a plane to always right itself, to always, if I launched it in different orientations, how would it always come back to being level flight? And the last part was control. And he started on these experiments by making ornithopters. Many early pioneers of aviation started on this path, not having much success. So get out in the middle of the field, make big wings, and try to flap <laughs> as hard as you can, and it's not going to work. And the neighboring ranches were like, wow, that guy from the Northern California, he's kind of weird. That's a crazy thing to be doing. And they'd talk to the parents and say, your son's a little different than the rest. What's going on with him? There was a lot of ridicule, and it really affected John personally. He did not like that. He went to experimenting a lot of these things in secret after that ridicule. Um, and the parents were not pleased at all about the son's activities as well, because they were getting the ridicule too. Um, he then went to construct free flight model gliders. I think one of the first Americans to experiment with free flight model gliders to test theories of design about why wings work and how they work before he made manned gliders. And in 1883, he actually started construction of his first manned glider, 
might be a little bit difficult to see, but it's a, it's a wing shape here with an elevator. Uh, we don't have a good drawing of glider number one. We have good drawings of glider number two and glider number three that I'll show you in just a second. So it's theorized that it might have looked like this. It has a parabolic airfoil. It has a controllable elevator with a pulley system. So you've got pitch control. Uh, there's no roll, there's, uh, you've got roll control by moving your body back and forth, weight shifting like a hang glider pilot would do. And there's no yaw controls, no rudder, which makes it kind of exciting. Uh, this glider flew, again, I know it's difficult to see, but we think based on the designs from glider number two and glider number three, there's a bigger moment between the trailing edge and the elevator. But it had this parabolic airfoil because he looked at birds, he captured birds, he shot birds, he tacked the wings up on the barn, let them dry and understood the parabolic curve of a wing very early and tried to test that to see if that was important. So this first glider flew in 1884, making short glides down the Mesa at Otay Mesa. Generally in secret, his brothers would know about the experiments, and I'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. Um, but during that same time frame, when he's having the success with gliders, very short hops, his father, who was a well-known politician and attorney, was selected to be uh, the U.S. Assistant Attorney General for President Grover Cleveland in Washington, D.C. And so there was considerable press put on the family here in San Diego, uh, and the family, except for John and his brother Richard, all moved to Washington, D.C. during Zach's term with President uh, Cleveland. Um, I got to think that the dad probably said, you know, hey, cut out the gliding experiments for a little bit till we're gone. Then you're free to do what you want to do, but still do it in secret, right? Because no one needs to know what you're doing, because it's a little different than the rest. Uh, but they wrote letters to each other, and a few of these letters have survived, not many of them. Uh, I know it's uh, difficult to read the letter, but Every time John would go out experimenting with these gliders, he would try to hide the glider at, on a, in hay to make it look like he's going to go deer hunting so no one would really see the glider. He's carrying a big shotgun. He'd go out early in the morning. And this is the return letter from his father, Zachariah. The whole family had taken great delight in his success as a deer hunter. And we're now waiting anxiously to hear the result of his next experiment with this flying machine. So in the family, they knew he was experimenting. They knew he was having success. Just no one outside the family knew. And in fact, if you read on, I know it's difficult. It says the girls will wait to see him land on top of the Washington Monument. So it's, you know, it's a real big joke in the family, but keep going because it's a good thing. He made another glider. He still did not understand the importance of a parabolic airfoil to generating lift. He knew it was good because the birds did it, but he didn't understand the physics of why. So he made the next glider, uh, again, very difficult to see on this image, but it has dihedral in the wing, uh, just like a turkey vulture would. Uh, he added spring-controlled flaps on the trailing edge of each wing. So essentially, the entire uh, back edge of the, of the wing was an aileron. They were spring-loaded to be neutral, but by controls on the foot, you could make them go up or down. So now you've got an elevator in one hand, you've got foot control for ailerons, and still no rudder. And the other thing he changed is he took away the parabolic curve and made it a flat plate airfoil. So not necessarily as lifting as the first glider. He also changed the way of launching. The first way of launching was to run off the side of this cliff as if you were a hang glider pilot and you glide down. He found that to be pretty challenging, especially to get enough airspeed. So he developed a, a rail launch system where he put the glider on top of a dolly, set a set of two by fours like a railroad track down this nice hill, would set the glider on, you sit in the glider, you roll down the hill, getting enough speed and you come fly off the dolly. This glider flew, it did not fly as well as the first one, but it was more controllable, which was great. And he made a third glider in 1885. Again, more control, looking for control. This whole wing would rotate around a pivot point where each wing could be independently rotated by the operator. So now you've got three control surfaces and you've only got two hands, interesting stuff. You can rotate the wings or you could do the elevator. Right? Pretty stuff, you gotta be very quick. Uh, and also the wings now had a bowed uh, effect rather than being just dihedral. It still has a little bit of dihedral, but it's more like a gull. Um, and, he, and to change the airfoil one more time, instead of using a parabola, which worked well, instead of using a flat plate, he went back to the parabola but twisted the leading edge up and twisted the trailing edge up. He did not ever write why he did that, but I think, we've looked back now, I think it was a controlled experiment for the parabolic curve to say, if I really messed up the flow of this curve, is it really the flow that's important or is it something else that's important about this system? So it was like a third experiment, it was a control experiment for the success of glider number one. This glider flew, but not well, and it was more controllable than the second glider. 
Science teaches you to change one variable at a time. He's changing multiple variables at the same time <laughs> because the cost and time involved in building this in the barn is expensive and he's probably reusing parts from one glider to the next. We're not sure. After the experiments with those three gliders, being the physicist, he set forth to understand the basis of flight as an aeronautic, aeronautics principle. He set up this water tank. This is in the 1880s in the middle of nowhere, south of San Diego, with a hose of water going into this tank. And the water goes around and around and around in this tank. And you can put different surfaces here and look at them and watch the flow over the surface. He was trained in water-based physics, so that made a lot of sense, to see if any kind of lift was pushing the surface through the current. He then made a smoke chamber and using cigar smoke, would watch the smoke go over a, a surface that was underneath a glass plate. So he could watch the smoke go over the surface and see if it had the same effect as it had in the water. So I think he's the first American to understand aeronautics based principles, physics based principles, taking what worked in water and recognizing that the air is a fluid medium, which is really neat. He then started using these tools, very primitive tools, to, to start understanding the basis of center of pressure, center of lift, flow over an airfoil, he had a lot of that down even as early as 1886, which is way ahead of everyone else. He started writing a manuscript called Soaring Flight uh, in 1893 that set forth all these theories about rotation around a, uh, an airfoil, current flow over an airfoil, a pressure bubble over an airfoil. Uh, that was rejected for publication by Scientific American because it was 133 pages long and it's pretty dense uh, reading. Uh, but that original manuscript still survives. It's at the San Diego Air and Space Museum in a new exhibit that they have now from Montgomery that I helped uh, create. So you can go see that original manuscript if you'd like. Uh, I think it's the oldest living Montgomery uh, document in the world. And you can, you can see that he, uh, in 1894, he has circulation of flow around an airfoil. He has, by 1897, a pressure bubble on the upper surface. He's got center of pressure, center of lift, uh, and he's got a refined view of that by 1907 of flow and even turbulence around the tips and things. So really early aeronautics. In 1905, by 1905, he had moved back to the Bay Area. He was designing fully wing warping systems that are tandem wing gliders like this one. So one, two wings, elevator control. He now has a huge fin for yaw control because of all the problems he'd experimented with in the 1880s then in San Diego. And this glider uh, had a, a trained aeronaut named Daniel Maloney, who was a trapeze artist who was familiar with working under balloons at high altitude to do trapeze work. Back in the 1900s, people would pay 10 cents to watch you go up in a hot air balloon and then perform trapeze acts underneath, hoping you wouldn't fall. Maybe they pay the 10 cents because they're looking for you to fall. Some people would use a parachute and jump off. That was worth 15 cents. He was one of these trapeze artists that didn't kill himself. He must be pretty good. So he got trained in how to fly gliders. And then they would launch these gliders by balloon. So you, you fill this huge hot air balloon, the glider gets elevated by the balloon to 4,000 feet. Glider pilot pulls the release lever and then glides back down. 15 to 17 minute glide duration in 1905 to a prescribed landing down at the site of the takeoff. All under control with wing warping systems and an elevator. Uh, and I also, also say this was the first public display of aviation in America, very widely displayed in the US, I'm uh, sorry, in San Francisco, widely advertised. And it was predating Curtis's public flights in 1909 and the Wright Brothers' public flights, which happened far later. So really, America's first public display was a glider in 1905. But despite all those successes, and I want to also add, uh, unfortunately, Montgomery passed in a glider accident in 1911, uh, testing a new type of glider design that I'm happy to talk about afterwards. Um, but still, by the 1900s, gliding was still very primitive mainly based on hang gliding uh, of the Chinook type. So here's a glider, a, a three-decker glider, a uh, hang glider pilot here. And in 1909, there was, I believe, the first glider meet in America held in Los Angeles. Six gliders were entered uh, at this aeronautical show. Uh, the idea there was you have a rope. Uh, your hopefully best buddy is pulling the car rope. He's an automobile tied to the other end. Hopefully he knows what speed to drive at. You attain the right speed and then hopefully you have time to let go of the rope and then glide back down safely. They were doing these experiments in a very, very limited uh, track and field area. And Edgar Smith, the gentleman who's pictured here, um, I have to read this to you because it's priceless. It's out of aeronautics in the time frame, but it says, Edgar Smith came in first with his three-decker glider. A tow line was attached 
to an automobile and he attempted to cut loose and glide after attaining the proper speed. Great difficulty was experienced owing to the limited space and to the fact that the stadium was surrounded by a brick wall. <laughs> on one occasion, he rose 10 feet into the air. On another trial, he was towed 75 feet free of the ground, and for 25 feet of that distance, he was free from the pole of the automobile, and that won him the Leonard Cup that was first place. <laughs> so for a flight of 25 feet in 1909, that was a considered huge success if he 10 feet off the ground. Right? Really, it was still very difficult to get off the ground. Amazingly, though, in 1911, um, Orville Wright had the idea of going back to Kitty Hawk specifically to try to use the currents, use the wind currents that hit the big dunes at Kitty Hawk, recognizing that those winds are going up as a kind of inverted waterfall. Would it be possible to fly a motorless aircraft in that inverted waterfall where the glider's falling at a rate less than that inverted waterfall and remain either stationary or even climb as a bird would and soar? And the first demonstration of soaring in the world was by Orville Wright at Kitty Hawk for nine minutes and 42 seconds in 1911. And that made world news that someone, namely Orville Wright, was able to fly in this configuration, basically motionless, hovering in a very, very, very strong wind at Kitty Hawk. How strong was the wind? Yes, yeah, so it was 30 to 40 knots, they were saying, which is really strong for that kind of a plane as well. Yeah. Um, so again, despite that success, gliding was still in its infancy. And it wasn't until the Treaty of Versailles, at, at the end of World War I, that part of the Treaty of Versailles forbid the Germans from flying powered aircraft. They were so proficient in World War I at flying powered aircraft that they said no more. But they were creative people, and they said, well, we're going to still fly, we're going to use gliders, we're not using motors. And they trained a whole young group uh, to fly gliders from hillsides to still get into aviation. These pilots later became the Luftwaffe for World War II. They were trained to become those pilots for their whole childhood. And it wasn't until then, the late 1920s, when America experienced this romanticism with aviation because of Charles Lindbergh and Amelia Earhart, that finally the youth of America was like, you know, gliding's kind of cool. I could be Lindbergh if I could just get off the ground. Why don't I go build a glider in my garage and see if I could be Lucky Lindy? And that really started gliders as an inexpensive aerial adventure. One of those kids that grew up at that time was a gentleman named William, William Holly Bolas, and I'll talk a lot about Bolas today because he's so central to Southern California's history and soaring. As a, as a kid growing up in San Fernando, he built 11, oh, sorry, 15 different gliders from 1911 to 1929. These were mainly hang gliders of different types. Um, so adept at those designs, uh, he was then hired by Claude Ryan to help run Ryan Aircraft in San Diego, and later then became the superintendent of construction on the Spirit of St. Louis the person in charge of making sure that plane was going to get out the door on time. Uh, and he did. Uh, also helped a little bit with the construction. But after that success, uh, he set off on making his number 16 glider, which was really the first true American designed and built sailplane. It was a plane specifically designed to be as aerodynamic as possible, as lightweight as possible, with the idea of soaring and trying to beat Oral Wright's record because it's still 1929 and no one's flown longer than 9 minutes and 24 seconds in America. The Germans have flown far longer. It was time for America to kind of catch up. So that was test flown at Lindbergh Field. Uh, it looks like this. Yeah, a rudder and elevator control, conventional. Uh, but it also had these tip ailerons. They started out as conventional ailerons and later were converted to being tip ailerons. First of all, with independent control and then later connected control. Uh, and just so the audience understands, maybe most of you do, but maybe there are a few that don't, uh, the difference between a glider and a sailplane I'll talk in the vernacular at the time. Uh, gliders in that time where you, know, you get up to the top of a hill and you, uh, you launch off and you glide down to the bottom and then you and your best friends, and maybe if, a, if you have a horse you're lucky, pull the glider all the way back up to the hillside and then your next best friend takes the launch again. It's a long day. Uh, sailplanes are, you launch into the air and hopefully you can stay up and, and soar in this inverted waterfall of air that's going and extract energy. And that means that you're actually soaring and that makes you successful as a sailplane. Designing a plane specifically to do that is a sail plane. So in 1929, as the youth of California, specifically Southern California, really got into gliding, um, there were three glider contests here in Southern California, one in Long Beach and two in San Diego. Uh, right at Long Beach Airport, when it was a dirt field, that was the first one, and two off the south coast of, south side of Mount Soledad in La Jolla, facing Pacific Beach. Uh, these were these kind of primary gliders of the type, we have a model here at quarter scale. But uh, basically, wood, wood construction, pilot sits up front, and you have your 
you have a, what's called a shock cord. It's a rubber rubber cord uh, that you spread out before takeoff. Uh, you, you set it up in a V formation. You have a set of best friends on the left and a set of best friends on the right. When someone says go, they both run down the hill as fast as possible. You have your really, really best friend back here holding onto a rope at the back of the tail, putting energy into your system. And when he says done, that's it. Bang, off you go up the side of the mountain like a slingshot. And uh, hopefully you survive the high G load takeoff. And you can glide back down. This is actually the Riverside Glider entry in one of these glider meets in San Diego. If you're familiar with San Diego, this is Mission Bay, and downtown would be over here in the distance. Um, but Holly Bolas, competing against those primary gliders, uh, entered his 16 sailplane, number 16 sailplane, and easily was higher performance, easily took every, con every contest, duration, altitude, distance. I should mention, not the altitude. On one occasion, one of these poor uh, primary glider pilots was launched with so much stretch that he zoomed up into a stall, a stall like this, almost barely came down and smashed, but just barely cleared the weeds. And so since he had such a high altitude gain, they gave him the cut for the altitude. <laughs> he survived, right? Um, they, they also won the spot landing contest. Did they really? <laughs> <laughs> Howie Wallace wouldn't go close to the pile of rocks. Okay, okay. All right, good to know. True. Good to know. Um, there was a contest at Redondo Beach. This contest was so popular that thousands of people, 20,000 people came out to witness this because gliders were the in vogue way of getting to the air. And this contest at, at uh, Redondo Beach, it's the right place, I'll show you uh, where it was. Unfortunately, they had very little wind. And so the top flight times were just minutes, very small numbers of minutes. Uh, it was at a location here, if you're familiar with, again, very hard to read. This is, uh, this is Los Angeles, Palos Verdes comes around in Long Beach down over here. The, the field is right along this, this border of trees on Arbolas uh, Drive. This border of trees is still there today. If you're familiar with Torrance, you see that tree line. The glider port was right there, Hollywood Riviera glider port. This is a picture of a primary glider in those days being launched. If you make it out over the edge, there's a nice cliff you can go soar back and forth on when there's wind. Um, Holly Bolas recognized, though, that he had something very special with that number 16 sailplane, and it was time to try to break Orville Wright's record. And so at Point Loma in San Diego, he set that glider up and was the first to fly more than that Orville Wright record in America with an American designed and built aircraft, uh, 14 minutes and 10 seconds, later for one hour, and then just at that same time, we're here in the Great Depression, right? The stock market crashed, news of the Great Depression was everything. He kept flying because it was uplifting. And in fact, these, these stories were uplifting. They made national news that someone was able to fly for one hour, two hours, five hours, nine hours with no motor. That made national news, headlines. Stock market's crashing, Holly Bullis is flying for nine hours with no motor. How's he doing? That's amazing. Some of these flights were spectacular, going into the nighttime with uh, you know, Model A Fords highlighting the, the road at, at nighttime with their headlights so he could come in and land when the wind quit. Amazing stuff. One of his students later on flew a, another Bolas sailplane for 15 hours at Point Loma. That was enough to exceed the then German world record. Unfortunately for that flight, no officials were on site for that flight. So it was considered unofficial, but he still got a certificate from the National Aeronautic Association for his good deed for beating the Germans. Because we had finally come back after 1930, finally proved that Americans could fly longer than Germans with sailplanes. San Diego, again, it's hard to read, but San Diego, uh, you know, we're up here in March Air Force Base, uh, March Field. Uh, you come down to San Diego, Otay Mason's down near the border. I talked about Point Loma. I'm going to focus it on Mount Soledad in La Jolla and also at the Torrey Pine Spider Port. Hearing the news of all these great achievements by Bolas, reading in the New York Times, Charles Lindbergh said, that is the coolest thing ever. You can fly a glider. Holly Bolas, I know that guy. He built the Spirit of St. Louis up. That's great. I'm going to fly. Let's go out to San Diego and learn how to do soaring, because that's just something I've got to do. So he and his wife, Anne, came to San Diego specifically to learn how to do soaring from Bolas in early 1930. Uh, January, we learned how to fly in a Bolas sailplane. And then Anne very courageously uh, learned how to fly and uh, became the first woman in America to receive a first-class glider license with a flight of over six minutes from Mount Soledad. Um, later, as I'll mention it, uh, Charles Lindbergh launched off the top of Mount Soledad, recognizing that these big cliffs to the north of Mount Soledad might produce lift. He flew in that direction, those cliffs of the Torrey Pines Cliffs. He flew through that lift, kept going, kept going, and landed on the beach at Del Mar. And that's the first use of the lift at Torrey Pines by anyone for soaring, was Charles Lindbergh in a bullet sailplane. So here's some pictures from that time. Now, I gotta say, Anne was extremely courageous. In the morning at Lindbergh Field, you get trained in a primary glider. This is Tilly the Toiler, they called it. 
Again, you're towed behind a car. You get up at about 15 feet just to understand the controls. She'd have a little bit of flight time beforehand on other powered planes, but you know, you're just going to feel the controls. The car's going to slow down. You're going to land. Let's go have lunch. And then after lunch, we're going to put you in a sailplane, and we're going to launch you off the top of the mountain. And that's the way it is. Uh, this is Charles Lindbergh wondering if that's such a great plan. <laughs> um, she was also pregnant at the time, uh, first, first trimester of pregnancy. Uh, so very gracious woman. Uh, successful flight. And this is Charles Lindbergh with Holly Bolas giving instruction before his flight uh, in February 1930 and being launched off. This is the shockboard crew that's about to fall over, uh, launching Charles Lindbergh into the air. And this is uh, after the landing at Del Mar, north of Torrey Pines, and taking the glider apart. People would stop their cars to watch this great plane land, come up and say, did your motor fall off? Where's your motor? Are you, oh my goodness, you're Charles Lindbergh. What's going on? Like national news again. San Diego was crazy because the Lindberghs were flying gliders in San Diego. All the kids were like, oh my goodness, this is the coolest thing ever. We gotta go do this. So Holy that was, regarded sorry, as a question, question. cross-country flight in a glider? It was a, it was a 15-mile flight. It set a Western distance record at the time. Mm -hmm. Again, Holly Bullis recognized he had something very special with this design. Set up a factory, one of the first glider factories in America, in the same tuna factory that was the place that they built the Spurry St. Louis. That building still exists down near Lindbergh Field, part of solar turbines today. This is that factory. And also set up a glider school, one of the first glider schools in America. This is the first graduating class. But as I have to say, kids, 16-year-olds, high school students, really got into gliding. And every town in Southern California had its own glider club. It was amazing. Uh, Riverside had its own, Redondo Beach, Monterey Park. Um, they all recognized, though, that you know, the same problems we have today. Where do we fly? How do we protect the flying site because it's so precious to us? Let's form an association of glider clubs because we're more powerful as a group than individually. And they said it's like the AAA of gliders. They set up the Associated Glider Club of Southern California. That club still exists. It flies sailplanes in San Diego. It's the oldest glider club in America. And I'm fortunate to be the historian for that glider club. More importantly, those kids were in high school and convinced the woodshop teachers in the high school to build gliders and not chairs. So now you've got woodshops, you yeah, sure, let's build a glider. You want to build something? We'll build it. Let's build it. No boats, let's build planes. And particularly, one uh, woodshop instructor, a guy named Lee Tang Kittredge at San Diego High School, fantastic individual, was a World War I pilot in, uh, for America with the uh, Lafayette Escadrille. Uh, happy to teach kids how to make airplanes. This is fantastic. They built 20 gliders out of San Diego High School. His rule was he would take the first flight, demonstrate that it's airworthy, Okay, kids, it's yours. Do whatever you want to do with it. Have fun. So kids would take these gliders everywhere. Any hillside, let's go fly. Great stuff. This is the San Diego High School Bullis sailplane from 1933. It's patterned just after Bullis. You see all the high school kids. That's what they would do on the weekends. They would learn how to fly. <coughs> One of the students at San Diego High School was a gentleman named Charles Friel. He had the idea of making a flying wing. This is 1935, so just about Northrop time. But let's make a model of it first to show that this isn't such a wacky idea. He made a three-flight model of it. Convinced the woodshop teacher, we're going to build a real one. So this is the woodshop class at San Diego High School in 1936. They built this. They flew this off of Vulcan Mountain, which is near Julian, uh, in the backcountry of San Diego County. Uh, successful flights. was difficult to control. They had to come up with the whole worm drive system for elevons and pitcherons. It was great stuff. Ended up having a really hard landing and made a great bonfire. <laughs> that was the end of that climate, right? That doesn't exist anymore. But these high school kids were training other high school kids, because there's no instructors, right? So you, the one, who's flown the longest? I want to fly, train me. And one of the best places to do that training was on the beach at, the glider, at Torrey Pines, because that's where Charles Lindbergh had flown, it must be okay. So we'll go take the Model T, we'll put our Model T on the beach, we'll put the glider behind it, we'll tow it up, and then we'll release, we'll release and be able to fly back and forth in that lift on the cliff and land back on the beach when we want to. That was 1930 to 1935. The fishermen were not very happy with that concept because they're trying to cast, and here was this glider for me. What are you doing, <laughs> kids? Very luckily for those kids, a gentleman named Woody Brown, who I'll talk a lot about coming up, was an East Coast glider pilot who moved to La Jolla, uh, became very adept at surfing, and also found these kids on the beach flying gliders. He's like, why are you not just launching off the top of the cliff? It's a 300-foot cliff. These kids were a little bit afraid about launching off of hit 300. He's like, I'll do it. Let's do it. So he was the first one in 1935 to launch a sailplane and land on back at the top of the cliff. And from then on, the Torrey Pines Glider Port was born. 
Uh, and it was so popular from 1935 to 1938 that the mayor of San Diego dedicated that location for the youth of California for its use as a glider port. So here's some pictures from that time frame. This is a two-place primary glider on the beach at Torrey Pines. This is a high school student, David Robertson, he's probably about 18 years old in the photo, and 16-year-old Mary Wind is the student. That's the instruction, right? Wow, students training students, I love it. Here's a two, this is John Robinson, a graduate of San Diego High School. John was a fantastic welder, started making steel tube fuselages. This is the Swift that he had made with Woody Brown. This is Woody Brown. And this is a glider they would launch and land off the top of the cliffs. I'll talk about these two gentlemen coming up. This is a picture from the cockpit of the Swift, sailplane looking towards La Jolla, Scripps Pier in the distance, Mount Soledad. And this is the Robin sailplane uh, in 1937. This is the glider port in 1940. They were having large glider meets by 1940 at the glider port. Most of these sailplanes pictured are bolus sailplanes. He kept designing sailplanes, refining his designs, making kits that people could build in garages. So there's three baby albatross sailplanes here that were kit designs. This is a super albatross, and there's a Grunau baby two-place glider in the back over here. That was the club trainer. Um, but I have to say, a very special person was this John Robinson. Uh, he very fortunately inherited, through a circuitous route, this glider uh, called the Zenonia. And he and the Zenonia became quite a pair. I'll talk about him coming up. This was the first sailplane to have a 30 to 1 glider ratio in America, probably in the world, uh, designed by Harlan Ross, also from Southern California. Uh, Johnny flew that plane over and over and over again on the weekends, experimenting with different CG, uh, changing the control surfaces, changing what he could. Every weekend was a new experiment. Let's refine it, let's hone it in. And credited that training with that glider with all of his success to come that I'll talk about. Woody Brown um, also had great success in every flying way every weekend at Torrey Pines, learning how to fly his craft. He bought one of these bolus baby albatross, the Thunderbird he called it, and entered a contest at Wichita Falls, Texas. Uh, the contest was a glider contest. You can choose where you're going to go fly to for that day as a goal. He chose the goal of Wichita, Kansas, which was, of course, all the way across Oklahoma. Everyone's like, Woody, you're going to fly across the whole state of Oklahoma. He's like, I'm going to fly across the whole state of Oklahoma. Like, you're out of your mind. 280 miles. So he took a ham sandwich with him. Off he went. And 10 hours later, he's over Wichita, Kansas. And he landed, and he was successful. He forgot to eat the ham sandwich. <laughs> a little bit busy that day. Very busy. Especially the last like hour was very tense. 280 goal flight, world record for distance at the time. Received a telegram from the president, who was so amazing. Was in Ripley's, believe it or not. Got a parade in Wichita the next day. Got a parade in Wichita Falls the day after. This was a heroic accomplishment. Woody, though, was one of these very special human beings. I had the pleasure of meeting and interviewing both Woody and John Robinson many times. Woody um, had this mantra of always wanting to do sort of work with nature rather than against nature. If you're going to put a propeller on your plane, you're not working with nature. You're pulling yourself through the air. That's not working with nature. Work with what nature gives you. He, after his time in San Diego, during his time in San Diego, uh, became an avid surfer, uh, was one of the first to build ho hollow, lightweight longboards. He recognized that the surfers in San Diego were having these heavy plank, 10-foot longboards. Why don't you build them hollow with ribs, like an airplane wing, and make them lighter construction? Great idea. He's also one of the first to think about putting on a skeg, a rudder, a fin, on a surfboard, it's just like a rudder in an airplane. He understands you're going to need to have some directional stability if you're going to use a long one. So taking his experience from flight and putting it into surfing. He later moved to Hawaii. He was one of the first uh, Caucasians to surf pipeline in Waimea uh, in the north shore of Oahu. Unfortunately, uh, on one of those experiences, the, first experiment, the very first experience going out to pipeline, uh, went out with a friend, Dickie Cross, uh, went out, the waves were pretty big, but still not ginormous, so they're surfing. The waves are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Pretty soon they're realizing it's like 20-foot sets, and it's kind of dangerous, and they want to just get back in. And they realize there's no way to get back in. The waves are just too big. So they paddled all the way around to a different inlet. The waves are still ginormous at that inlet. And it's getting to be nighttime, and it's time to just try to get in. So they both try to come in. Uh, Woody was a good free diver. He dove as deep as he could along the coral, and came in on the shore without any clothes on, but he survived. But his friend Dickie Cross never made it, and no one ever saw him again. And that's the first story of Caucasian surfing pipeline. 
No one surfed Pipeline again for another 15 to 20 years because of that story. But he was, he's recognized in surfing as a hero of surfing because of all he did to bring aeronautics to surfing and these giant waves that he was one of the first to explore. He also built this Monokai sailboat, catamaran, after the Polynesian style of making fast sailboats, he's like, I could give tourists rides for fun, we go really fast, it's great. The first tourist boat in Waikiki was, was Woody Brown's Monokai. One of the people that took a ride on that sailboat was Hobie Alter. They became great friends, Hobie and Woody. And Hobie said, you know, Woody, you've got a really good thing here, you might want to think about patenting it. And he's like, I just don't want to, that's not my thing, I want to build and take people for rides. Hobie, if you want to patent it, go ahead. And that was the introduction of Hobie to the catamaran, and that's why we have the Hobie cat and all the rest of it was because of Woody Brown influencing Hobie's design. I talked to both uh, Woody and Woody uh, knew Hobie. I knew Hobie as a kid. Uh, I never had a chance to ask Hobie those questions when I was a kid. I wish I had a chance to, but that was the story direct from Woody. After the, after the war, sorry, as I mentioned before, these, these glider, these training gliders like this TG2 and a, uh, LK-4A uh, were used to train people to fly gliders during World War II. Many of those pilots that were in Southern California trained as kids became the instructors for the Army uh, for the, uh, the training program to fly these very, very large troop transport gliders. Um, Bolas, again, kept, can, kept designing things. Uh, the Bolas road chief. Bolas wanted to go to glider competitions, but he was really tired of tent camping. So why not take the tent with you, behind you? So someone's gonna tow your glider, but you're gonna tow your trailer. And let's make an Airstream trailer, because I think aeronautically, let's make it aeronautic, so I don't have to bother so much gas. So this is one of the first Airstream trailers. It led to the Airstream. If you can find these used, they go for about $120,000. You can buy them new for $100,000 today if you'd like a new one. Very rare air trailers. He also made the XCG-16 glider, this design of a very, very large wing uh, tra troop transport glider. This is in 1943. And this XCG-16 was a, a fantastic design. It had two big doors here in the front that would open up. You have 20 people, 20 troops on either side, so 40 passengers, and then two pilots up here in the cockpit. 98-foot uh, wingspan. Uh, you could load this up either with people or with two howitzers, so it goes up to almost 20,000 pounds flying weight. 200-mile-an-hour uh, max speed uh, for flight, which is pretty fast for glider. Towed with what? Towed with a, uh, either a C-47 or a B-17. <laughs> so it's, you know, when it's loaded, you need the B-17. Um, they made a half-scale, still um, piloted model of this and flew it out at Murak Dry Lake. That flew fine. They made a full-sized prototype called the MC-1. That was flown at Camarillo and also here at March Field. And unfortunately, that crashed uh, uh, September 11th of 1943, uh, killing two people. One, a, a record holder pilot, uh, Dick DuPont, very good glider champion at the time, um, was never able to open his parachute on the way down. Um, I have a video at the end of the talk, if there's time, I have a, a color video of this flying at Camarillo on tow, so you get to see the tow if that's of interest and we have the time. Uh, but it has the March Field connection, so I wanted to make sure I put that in. After the war, those trainer gliders, like the TG2 we saw, became surplus and were picked up by people interested in recreational flying. At, on the cheap, they were inexpensive, very inexpensive. And people immediately came back to Torrey Pines because that had been the hotbed of soaring in San Diego and Southern California. And they set up this Pacific Coast Midwinter Soaring Championships, <clears throat> mainly to be held in February so that all the poor people suffering in the cold in the East Coast could come all the way to San Diego and enjoy some flying when they couldn't back in Ohio. Um, it was a friendly competition, not designed to be really serious competition. Uh, it attracted many local people to gliding. Cliff Robertson, the major movie actor, became a glider pilot because of these events, learned how to fly at Torrey Pines, uh, later flew lots of powered aircraft. Uh, they offered a John Montgomery Championship <coughs> trophy, had contests for distance duration, even a bomb drop, so on the way up the winch, you drop a sack of flour or sand to a target whose closest gets the win. It's just after the war, so you gotta have a bomb drop. Uh, you both winch launch and aero tow. The longest flight I'm aware of by winch launch was 183 miles to Brawley in the, in the desert uh, by Aeroto um, to Desert Center, which is almost the same distance, a little bit longer, uh, like 190 miles. At each glider meet, they'd have a queen, uh, typically someone uh, attractive from the local area. At this uh, particular meet, I think it was 1957, if I'm correct, uh, Raquel Welsh, Raquel Tejada, who was at La Jolla High School at the time, was selected as the meat queen. She later became famous because of Tory Pines' glider where she became famous. And each of these was broadcast nationally on TV on Wide World of Sports, uh, so you could watch on TV. Uh, 
literally thousands of spectators showing up to watch the activities. Lots and lots of fun for spectators. It's very, very rare to see this many people, this is where the Salk Institute is today, lined up to just watch someone the spot land a glider. Right? I wish those kind of events would happen today. We'd have a lot more people interested in aviation. Right? People recognized, though, in soaring to the 1930s, late 1930s, that you could use lifting currents, uh, the type that Montgomery didn't necessarily understand well enough, to rise like a bird under, under those kind of conditions, and then take that altitude and transfer it into distance to catch the next thermal and repeat that. And that the Earth heated up differentially based on the sun that day. One of the people that really first understood that and, and uh, exercised his fantastic piloting skills was that gentleman, John Robinson, I mentioned earlier. San Diego High School grad, really honed his skill at Torrey Pines, became the first three-time national soaring champion in America's history, uh, first to fly over 300 miles in a, in a glider that was the Zenonia sailplane, first to fly over 30,000 feet in a sailplane, the same Zenonia sailplane, uh, and also first in the world to earn Soaring's highest achievement award at the time, the Diamond Sea Badge. Uh, and I interviewed him many times. He credited all of that to his time and energy he spent honing his art at Torrey Pines, because that was his sort of outdoor wind tunnel. It was his testing room that he could really refine his art. And again, this was the first aircraft to have a 30 to 1 glide ratio. Uh, I asked Johnny, uh, this glider had spoilers. There aren't a lot of gliders and sailplanes in the 1930s that did have spoilers. John specifically said that these spoilers were, were added in so that it would be easier to get a 30 to 1 glider ratio into a field the size of Torrey Pines. So to get the glider ratio down, because these things are so efficient to get them to land, you had to add air brakes. And now we have air brakes on other commercial jets and things of that nature, the first sort of a sailplane invention. Similar kind of thing to windows being used on sailplanes before commercial jets. Another gentleman, of course, the Southern California pioneer that probably many of you knew and I knew well, uh, Paul McCready. Another gentleman who spent a lot of time soaring sailplanes at Torrey Pines. Also became the next three-time winner of the Soaring Nationals. First in American history to be an international soaring champion. And he credited Torrey Pines with this mantra of doing more with less. Very much like Woody Brown, don't compete with the atmosphere, don't compete with the environment, use the environment to your advantage. Paul said, try to do more with less. Don't have to use gas if you don't have to. And of course, Paul, here in Southern California, went on to do some fantastic things in aerospace. Uh, uh, first, first human-powered flight across the English Channel, first solar-powered flight across the English Channel, unmanned aircraft to 80,000 feet that are solar-powered, um, fantastic achievement, radio-controlled flying flapping pterodactyls for IMAX movies, because that's just a cool thing to do, and the first electric-powered car, the EV-1 for GM, that was way ahead of its time, the, the Prius of the 1980s. <coughs> There's a third type of soaring, this wave soaring. So I talked about ridge soaring and thermal soaring. There's a, a thing called wave soaring. Wave soaring happens when you have a, a very strong wind hitting a very, very large mountain or, or, or a set of uh, hillsides, if you will, that generates a ripple in the atmosphere behind it. And there's areas of extreme uh, uh, uplift and there's extreme down uh, turbulence in the back. And in between, there's a big rotor. Uh, this can happen as you would like a ripple in a, in a river, if you will, behind a rock. If you're a very good pilot and you know how to avoid these, these down, down zones, you can go up very, very high in these lifting areas. And in the 1950s, uh, UCLA, uh, through fun federal funding, investigated the Sierra Wave with a, a set of fantastic sailplane pilots, specifically to go and map this, to understand the nature of the wave and also understand the nature of clear air turbulence. Because a lot of the clear air turbulence we feel in a commercial jet may be these high altitude jet stream waves. And of course, then pilots recognize, well, if you can do that for science, you can do that for fun, uh, you can go up to very extreme altitudes. And so uh, very quickly, uh, Bill Ivins, another pilot that learned how to fly Torrey Pines, uh, went up and, and did an absolute game at 42,000 feet in 1950, followed very quickly by Paul Bickle, who was the head of NASA at Edwards Air Force Base at the time. In 1960, went up to 46,000 feet. And we have here with us Bob Harris, uh, who flew this sailplane, which is currently at the Uber Hazi Center in the Smithsonian to 49,000 feet in 1986, and I'd love to ask Bob some questions at the end. Where's Bob? Bob's right here. Got it. So we have the pilot who did that. Fantastic. Um, I could go on for like three hours about Lake Elsinore, Hemet, El Mirage. There's so many other places. There's not enough time. Uh, I do want to mention some other aspects of soaring because there's other communities that have had a similar kind of development, in fact, at the same locations, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention them. And I choose them, so it's fun. So one in particular is radio-controlled sailplanes. And in the 1950s, 
These places that were perfect for manned sailplanes became great testing locations for amateur radio operators with very, very large radios to put those radios into free flight model aircraft to try to control them just for fun. And back in those days, typically the control was just rudder and you had an escapement system that was a rubber band that was your power in the rudder. So basically you, had, you wound up the rubber, that was the number of turns you had, was the number of deflections you're gonna have in your control. And your rudder control is full left, back to neutral, full right, back to neutral. There's no in between. You have to preset the elevator beforehand, you better get it right, and you throw it off the cliff. And that's the control. And so doing that, one control rudder only, uh, a gentleman, a dentist named Bob Chase in San Diego uh, set an, a re world record for eight hours and 24 minutes of control at the Torrey Pines Glider Port. That was in 1956. With a rubber band with, with rudder? A, with a rubber band rudder. Huge rubber band, escapement system. Fantastic stuff. Very small changes. He calculated how many he's gonna have to do and did that course. Fantastic stuff. By the 1980s, the fabrication of model aircraft and the radio gear, fortunately, had gotten to the size where we could start making models that look and fly and feel like the real ones, which is very fun and, and interesting to do and recreate history. So even though you don't see primary gliders flying today from hillsides, you can make a radio control one and fly to Torrey Pines and, and feel what it was like and show what it was like. And a lot of the RCers, I have to say that San Diego and Southern California in general generates fantastic pilots, whether that's manned pilots or RC pilots, and many of the world's fantastic sailplane pilots for RC come from Southern California. Several in particular I had the great fortune of growing up with as a kid. Uh, one, it was Mark Smith. So in 1973, at the Torrey Pines Glider Port, um, Mark was known for his glider designs. Uh, he was contacted by a movie company. The movie company was making the movie Jonathan Livingston Seagull. And the movie company was very, uh, very disheartened that they couldn't get the seagulls to do aerobatics. <laughs> I want the seagulls to do a role. They won't do a role for me. So they contacted Mark and said, could you make a seagull model and have it do rolls and loops and we'll film it at Torrey Pines. He made these out of foam. Uh, yeah, there's a little bit of a, tr a, a trick. He's got a little plexiglass clear uh, Wing, winglets on the edge for control, for stability, but it had aileron control. And sure enough, you do all the loops and rolls they wanted all day long. It's fun stuff. People have designed all sorts of different types of radio control model designs you would never think to try, because Torrey Pines is this kind of outdoor wind tunnel. You can just go try it, throw it off, and see if it'll work. You know, flying saucer, you got a good idea, make a flying saucer and show it'll work. It's fun stuff. Other people, again, specifically interested only in recreating the history of sailplanes making the models as precise to the real one as possible, down to the maps in the cockpit, and the little control stick has to move with the servos. Sometimes the guy has to move his head and then wave as you fly by. <laughs> it's whatever level of detail you want to get to. Some people, like my friend Carl Gortney, who's unfortunately passed away about three years ago, he was a World War II glider pilot. He flew a CG-4A in Battle of the Bulge, and it looked like this. He made a model of it and flew to Torrey Pines to recreate his own history, which was fabulous. So people can have a different connection to the sport in different ways. And you just walk up to the cliff edge and you throw your beautiful model off. Also, ultralights have had a fantastic history of soaring in Southern California, both hang gliding from the 1960s and paragliding from the 1980s. And Torrey Pines is such a fantastic resource that four world records for endurance were established for hang gliding in the 1970s. The first one hour flight, the first two hour flight, the first three hour flight, and almost the first four hour flight. Those were fantastic achievements in the 1970s with Regalo wings. That was, a, that was a difficult thing. And people still fly hang gliders to Torrey Pines. This is the view from what it looks like today. It's a, the, the lift is the same. The view is a little different. And you can also fly a paraglider, you know, a, an airfoil-shaped parachute, if you will, that uh, collapses into a, a backpack. You could walk out for lunch, unfold your paraglider, jump off the cliff, fly for an hour, put it back in your backpack, go back to work, and have a nice day. People also now come to Torrey Pines to recreate primary gliders with modern mechanics. So this is the thing called the bug. It's a biplane primary glider with a wheel and a control stick. So you sit there like you're a primary glider pilot. It's got ailerons and rudder and elevator. And literally you just kind of roll off the edge and start flying. Uh, very lightweight, low wing loading aircraft, a lot of fun. And uh, sometimes uh, it's difficult, but sometimes the sailplanes come back to fly Torrey Pines. I'm typically the one that has to help with the paperwork to get that done. I'll explain why that's been difficult in a little bit, but it looks like this. This is a TG2 trainer glider. This is the one I had the pleasure of flying in. It's been restored to precise detail. We use a winch to launch them up, you, just like they used to do. You pull in the winch line very quickly. It raises the plane up into the air. The glider pilot releases, and then you can soar back and forth on the lift. Uh, as long as the lift is there, it's a great, great day. 
and land back at Torrey Pines. And I have to say that this resource, this Torrey Pines Viaport, is a very, very important historic asset. It really represents the 130 years that Southern California has been involved with gliding. It's the, one of the resources we have left. Back in the 1930s, just like roller coasters, glider ports would dot the Pacific Coast. There'd be Redondo Beach, Palos Verdes, uh, Malibu, uh, San Clemente had a glider port, uh, Oceanside, I can go up and down. The, whole, the only one left to represent that period is the Torrey Pines glider port. Uh, but it has this unique combination now of radio control models, hang gliders, paragliders, and sometimes mansail planes that makes it a really unique place to try to fly it. There's rules that have to go on. And also, one of the difficulties of the Torrey Pines glider port is that it's actually owned, the property is owned by two different organizations. One is the city of San Diego owns the coastal portion, the cliff edge, so this portion that's closest to the cliff, and the University of California owns the rear portion. And of course, this is the runway, so it's kind of like trying to play baseball in Yankee Stadium, and one ownership is in left field, and the other ownership is in right field, and you want to get together and play baseball. Sometimes right field wants to play basketball. <laughs> no, it's a baseball field. You know, it's difficult. Try to get them to work together. And unfortunately, over the last 10 years, there's been two buildings that I vehemently fought, uh, but have been built, uh, that do get in the way of the flight, a flight approach for sailplane traffic, for manned sailplane traffic. And I've had to work with the FAA to reorient the runway. We've gotten approval on that, but then go back to UCSD, and hopefully next year we're gonna get them back out again, flying under permission with the FAA. But it's a big process to do. When, uh, in 1989, the University of California made a long-range development plan, and that plan included building buildings on their portion of the glider port, academic buildings. And uh, I wasn't going to see that happen, and my father was not going to see that happen. We were going to battle that to the end. So the first thing we did was we went out to the National Soaring Museum, great museum in Elmira, New York. They have a program for national soaring landmarks. They go around the nation listing national soaring landmarks. It's honorific. It has no political advantage. It's just saying that some group thinks this is important. We got the first one west of the Mississippi for Torrey Pines. Shortly after that, we went to the city of San Diego and said, you know, here's this fantastic resource. I gave the history. Uh, the city of San Diego being the city of San Diego, University of California San Diego is a very, very big employer, an important, important group in San Diego. They know their politics. They said, we don't own the state portion. We own only the city portion. We agree with you that the whole place is historic, but we can only designate the city portion. So we got left field. We didn't get right field. That didn't feel right. So then uh, my father and I went to the state, uh, Sacramento. We battled very, very hard against the UC Regents who did not want to have this historic designation, but we got it passed through. So it got listed on the California Register of Historic Places. I still didn't feel like that was enough. So we went to the federal level and uh, got it on the National Register of Historic Places because I really, really, really thought this is a really valuable resource for the youth of America. It's not just the youth of California. This is where people come. It's a mecca of soaring. You can't lose this place. After that, I still wasn't done. It's time to go back and make it a model aviation landmark. I recognize that this landmark series works very well for manned sailplanes. Model aviation happens to have its own landmark series. So I proposed that the Academy of Model Aeronautics, they agreed, and they made the first AMA historic site Torrey Pines in 2003. So it's got lots of history, lots of, uh, of plaques that honor it. It still takes some effort to try to protect it, and it still takes a considerable effort to get the manned sailplanes back again, which we're trying to do. Because of all that history and research, I wrote a book in 2000 called Wind and Wings that, that it, that's basically the kind of history I've taken you through today, mainly focused on San Diego. Uh, I wrote a biography about John Montgomery, as I mentioned, called Quest for Flight, uh, with the great-grandnephew of Craig Harwood of John Montgomery. This was a fantastic process because I met Craig Harwood uh, early in this process in 2002. How many of you remember Huell Hauser? California's goal, right? Everyone watched that show, everyone loved Huel Hauser, it's a shame he's gone. But Huel Hauser contacted me and said, Gary, we're gonna do a TV episode on Montgomery. You're the glider guy, come down and meet me in Chula Vista, we're gonna talk gliders. At that time, I didn't know much about Montgomery. I was like, okay, I'll show up. So I show up and there's this other guy, Craig Harwood. I'm like, boy, I hope you know more than me, because I don't know much, but we're gonna do this interview. We did the interview, and afterward, I learned that he was the great grandnephew of Montgomery. I'm like, can we please research this together? I'm hoping we can learn together. So it took 10 years of hard labor to get that book done and also find a publisher. We went through three different publishers. We finally found Oklahoma Press, University of Oklahoma Press that was willing to publish the book. It's hardly anyone publishes aviation history these days. It's unfortunate, but we got it done. I want to also mention briefly, this is the glider that unfortunately Montgomery passed in. It still exists. It's been restored. It's on loan from the Smithsonian to the San Diego Air and Space Museum. You can see it. The beauty of this glider, 
fantastic design and construction. All of the control is in the wing, both roll and pitch. This is a completely fixed tail. So he had a whole control system for warping the wing to do roll and pitch. It's pitch run. So first pitch run, 1911. Fantastic idea. And I most recently published a book uh, specifically about the Torrey Pines glider port. It's a photo book simply to get the public to understand why this is important, showing the photos from back to the 1930s to present of, you know, this is something to protect for San Diego. Before I quit, and hopefully there's time to show you that video of that XCG-16, I want to make mention that, you know, next year, 100th anniversary of March Field. I hope that there's going to be some celebration of this. I did a little bit of research. I'm not the historian for March Field. I know that March Field's already on the National Register, which is fantastic. The buildings across the way are a historic district. Uh, lots of buildings are involved in that history, but I do hope that there's some, um, some event that happens in March of next year, because I believe March Field was in March of 1918. That's the earliest I could find. Uh, hopefully someone will correct me on that. Um, and I do want to mention that there are many organizations that do soaring locally to March Field, uh, RC sailplane groups, uh, ultralight groups, and manned sailplane groups. There's far more than are listed here, but I just wanted to list them in case someone was interested in maybe going for a ride. You can get a ride in a sailplane. And I, before I end, I do want to have the radio control enthusiasts that have brought their planes, if Mike or someone else wants to get up and show the planes just briefly, I think it's important to kind of take them through the thermal duration versus scale. And I'm happy to start that with my primary glider. And I'll say, I'll say thank you early, but I'm going to talk about my planes real quick. So let me get my plane, and I'll come right back. Hang on. And while he's grabbing his plane, I'm just going to point out that, yes, April, 20, <coughs> April of 2018, uh, I think it's the second weekend, the March Air Show is going to be the 100th anniversary air show. So it's going to be the big one coming here to a March field near you. Great. Good, thank you that there's a good program for that. I hope that gets widely advertised. So this is a quarter scale a replica of a German primary glider. It's called an SG-38. It's got all the same controls that the real primary glider had, except, uh, in fact, the elevator is a pulley system. So the radio gear does a little pulley and pulls the elevator like the real one did. The, um, there's a servo-controlled rudder and servo-controlled aileron. So those are a little bit fake. But the rest of it, including the pilot's smile, very real. Uh, some people, again, they make the little, the little control stick move if you want to go to that detail. I didn't. But it's fun. And this uh, flies off the Torrey Pines Glider Port. I can just throw it off. It needs a good lift. It about, needs about 13 knots to be able to stay up. Very draggy plane. A lot of parasitic drag. Uh, when it comes in for landing, it feels like it's the space shuttle kind of coming down. It's <laughs> like, okay, I have to plan way ahead and I have to have a lot of altitude to make it back to the field. But it's a lot of fun. If you get rid of all the cables, there wouldn't be so much drag. If I got rid of the cables, it would help. But it wouldn't stay together. It's really flimsy without the cables. It needs it all. I will say I've winch launched this. I've put it up on a winch, uh, electric winch, to get it up in the air. I've also aerotowed it. So we have model, um, rig control model power planes. With a rope, you pull it up into the air, and then you release your little, your little servo mechanism. And you can glide back down. A lot of fun. So who's ever next? Mike, did you want to explain some of the Inland Soaring Society aircraft? Yeah. So this is Mike, Mike Lee. Uh, Mike's with the Inland Soaring Society. And now, Mike, I'll give you the mic. Mike, I'll give you the mic. <laughs> There's many different types of RC soaring. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Um, while Mike is getting his plane, I want to mention very briefly, there's a type of soaring called discus launch gliders. It's a rather new technology. It's a very small 60-inch, like one-meter wingspan glider. The gliders are made out of carbon fiber and Kevlar, so very, very, very strong. And the idea is you have a peg in one wing at the tip. You take that peg with your fingers and you spin like a discus athlete, you spin around really fast and then throw the glider into the air at very, very high speed. It goes up about 300 feet on a good launch. And from there you have to do certain tasks, like stay up for two minutes or stay up for five minutes and do certain things, come back and catch it or relaunch it again. Very fun. There's a very, very large contest coming up in two weeks in San Diego. It's the International Hand Launch Glider Festival. 75 pilots from around the world, Brazil, China, New Zealand, Australia, are all flying to San Diego to compete in this basically world championship that happens every year. Mike. Thank you. Yeah. I can hold that. That's all, right. all about that. Pretty good. So Mike. Well, I want to thank you, Gary, for inviting us down here to display our aircraft. What I'm holding in my hands is a uh, 12 and a half foot uh, wingspan shadow. It's the state of the art in the world competition in thermal duration. To give you a little bit more uh, perspective about how long these wings are, 
I'm going to tip them up. And now you can see what wingspan will do for you. Construction of this type of aircraft is mostly carbon fiber, Kevlar, and fiberglass. These are made mostly in the Ukraine. Uh, the story about how these things get so uh, uh, popular in the United States is that here in the United States to make a mold for this type of quality costs probably about $20,000 at a shot to make each mold. A mold for the tail, a mold for the wing, a mold for each wing half, two slides and all like that. And it, it, that becomes pretty uh, expensive to make an airplane and uh, limited on the amount of people who can afford it. In the Ukraine, when the Iron Curtain dropped, there was a lot of uh, aerospace industries going on out there, building fighters and bombers and all like that. But all of a sudden they went idle because there was nobody to shoot at. So they found out that, you know, sitting around with these machine shops out there was just letting everything rot unless you maintain them. But it just so happens that someone said, well, can't we just uh, make some small molds for our model airplanes? Well, guess what? Making small airplane parts was better than maintaining the equipment by hand and trying to keep it from rusting and stuff like that. So they let them use it for free. The only thing they had to do was buy their own stock. Now these molds only cost about $5,000, making them far more uh, within the reach of the average modeler. This aircraft is capable of flying as slow as 7 miles per hour and as fast as 110 miles per hour on the brake. It's, it is stressed for 14 Gs positive, 8 Gs negative, and... Uh, Hope you'll never do 14 Gs. <laughs> uh, yeah, we get really close to it on launch. Uh, these are mostly launched by um, monofilament line, which stretches quite a bit, and they got about 80 pounds worth of tension on that line. When they're released, they get from zero to 500 foot in about three and a half seconds. <laughs> That's from the standing stop. And we have another glider here, this uh, the scale glider. Uh, yeah, I'm going to let uh, my teammate, Tom Trivet, uh, discuss that aircraft. By the way, I want to thank the, uh, the uh, museum for allowing us to be here. This is an inspirational place, believe me. Uh, I'm a veteran of eight years in the Air Force. And I've seen this bird before, but every time I see it again, it, 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 I'm, I'm breathless, I'm sorry. I love that airplane, and, and I'm proud to have been serve, serving the Air Force. Tom? This is a, this is a Nimbus IV scale glider. 22 foot wingspan. It's mostly made of fiberglass. It, uh, this is an aero tow airplane, so there's a, there's a tow release in the nose. Put a line in, servo clamps it shut, then the tow plane hauls you up, and then when you get to altitude, flip the switch on your transmitter, and it releases the tow hook, and you're free to fly around. And they, they go up to what? They release about 500, you know, about up to 1,000 feet, probably, before they, before they release. That's a 22-foot wingspan. 22-foot wingspan has 12 servos, has flaps, two sets of ailerons, mm. each wing, and spoilers, rudder and elevator. And no rubber a, bands? Pardon me? No rubber bands? No rubber bands, no. <laughs> this one, I, I have two uh, eight uh, servo receivers in here, so I can have 16 channels. I run 12 channels. It also has a wheel and landing gear that comes down. How much? <clears throat> How much? Um, this one I actually bought used for a really good price. What's a really good price? Yeah, what's a really <laughs> good price? Guesses? I'll give you two bucks. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I only paid about 900 for this one. That's wow. cheap. Wow. Wow. That is a good a price. price. <laughs> wow. $800. I'm sure <laughs> the list price is closer right to what? Two grand or more? Thank you guys. Yeah, just a video real quick. So this is, I'll just do just a few seconds of this video. This is this XTG-16 sailplane glider. This is at Camarillo uh, on the test flights. Unfortunately, this is the one that crashed at March Field. Uh, hopefully you won't see it crash. Just a second. Just put it there. There we are. So uh, no, no audio with this on the audio. This is uh, getting ready for the tow. It's on tow right now. Uh, this, is March field? this is at Camarillo, but this is the same plane that did crash at March. Uh, I, if anyone can identify what that tug is, I don't exactly know what it is. This would have been, it almost looks like a Liberator or something, but uh, this would have been uh, no load. This is just one of the early flight tests at Camarillo. If you're familiar with Camarillo Airport, you can see the hillside in the back this, that looks familiar to the north. Yeah. 
This was what year? This would be 1943. That tow plane kind of for an instant looked like a B-25, but... Uh, it could have been a B... Those are two prop... Twin engine. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, <clears throat> There's some pictures of it on the tow, and then I'll, once you get to see it in the air, it's kind of an interesting shape, and then I'll, then I'll call it. Second. That's the landing gear coming up. It looks like a, you know, we're flying in a 747 here and it's a glider. What, what did they power the landing here with? Uh, Don't know. Must have had an engine on board for maintaining hydraulics. What's the glide ratio? Great question. What's the glide ratio? I really don't have a good answer on that one. Um, I, I just do not know. I can try to research that. That's a good one to know. I do know that for the CG4A, which was the other like major um, troop transport glider, there was a story of a gentleman named Don Stevens, who was a Southern California product, uh, who was a test pilot and glider instructor. And he was charged with having to test fly the CG4A and ended up um, not only looping it, <laughs> but ridge soaring it too. Uh, so it was capable of soaring flight. And looping? He made, he made sure he looped the CG4A. <sighs> oh, a CG one of the Waco gliders? One of the Waco gliders, yes. <laughs> You've seen the picture, of course, of the one losing its wings. I have. I have. It was a dangerous thing to be doing. Anyway, I'll have this going. I thank you for your time and attention. I do have some books. If you're interested in purchasing one of my books, I'm happy to have that happen. I'm happy to do that afterwards. Thank you again for your time and attention. I appreciate it. certificate that we give to our speakers, and uh, it's to Dr. Gary Vogel, thanking him for his presentation today, and uh, thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you.